Western Australia isn't just on the edge of Australia, it is on the edge of the world. This is Cottesloe Beach, and from here you can see Rottnest Island, but beyond that is the vast Indian Ocean and then South Africa. Western Australia makes up roughly one third of the island continent of Australia, but only has 11% of Australia's population. 2.6 million people live in an area approximately the size of Western Europe. However, despite its small population, Western Australia is still able to boast a remarkable list of firsts. In 1921, Edith Cowan became the first woman to be elected to an Australian Parliament. Her portrait is in pride of place here at the Western Australian Parliament next to other women who have served the Parliament with distinction. However, in those early days, there were no special concessions given to female members. When Mrs Cowan was a member here from 1921 to 24, there were no dedicated toilets to women. And so, she would walk into the toilets, order the men out, and have a friend guard the door. Quite a formidable woman. Edith Cowan was also the first woman in Australia to have a civic monument dedicated to her. It is situated here, at the entrance to Kings Park in Perth, and very near Parliament House. It is only metres away from the home where Mrs Cowan lived when she was a Member of Parliament. Handy if you have to dash home quickly to the toilet. That home was transported to Edith Cowan University in Joondalup and now includes the Peter Cowan Writers' Centre, named after her grandson. Edith Cowan was the first woman in Australia and one of the few in the world to have a university named after her. Indira Gandhi and Mother Teresa are two women also given that honour. To give you an idea of how opposed some people were at the time to the election of women to Parliament, it is worth mentioning that on the ballot paper for the 1921 election, Edith Cowan's name was printed as Mrs James Cowan. It was the convention of the time to refer to a married woman by her husband's name. But even when Edith died in 1932, the tribute in the local newspaper had the headline, Death of Mrs James Cowan, OBE. In reality, Edith Cowan never lived under the shadow of any man. Edith Brown, her maiden name, was a member of the pioneering Wittenoom family. Her grandfather, Reverend John Burdett Wittenoom, was the first Anglican priest in Western Australia. When Edith was seven years old, her mother died in childbirth and her father, Kenneth Brown, remarried. But he was a violent and troubled man and murdered his second wife. He was executed here at the Old Perth Jail in Northbridge, which is currently a construction site for the Western Australian Museum. So by the age of 16, Edith was orphaned and at age 18 married James Cowan. She was on the board of 60 committees, was at the forefront of the struggle for voting rights for women and was the mother to five children. Hers was a truly remarkable life, a life marked by tragedy and triumph in equal measure. The life of the next woman to be elected to the Western Australian Parliament had a tragic ending. May Holman was the first woman to represent the Labor movement as a Member of Parliament anywhere in the world and the first woman to serve more than 10 years in any Westminster Parliament. On the eve of the 1939 Western Australian state election, she was seriously injured in a car accident but lived long enough to be declared the victor in her seat of forest but died the following day. May was elected to Parliament following the death of her father J.B. Holman, and was subsequently followed by her brother, Edward Holman, in the same seat in a by-election. One of the first family dynasties in the Western Australian Parliament. In the words of a future Prime Minister, John Curtin, she will have a precious place in the annals of our cause. The name Forrest is one of the most recognisable names in Western Australia. Forrest Place in the Perth CBD, the Forest Highway to Bunbury, parliamentary districts, suburbs, schools and hotels are all named after Sir John Forrest, the first Premier of Western Australia. John Forrest was the first Australian-born person to be knighted and the first non-British person to be recommended to be elevated to the peerage in the British House of Lords. Sadly for Western Australia, Sir John and Bunbury, his hometown, he died from skin cancer on the ship off the coast of Africa on his way to London to take his seat in the House of Lords as Baron Forrest of Bunbury. He was buried in Sierra Leone and reinterred later at Karakata Cemetery in Perth. 
So the Lord Forest Hotel in Bunbury is named after a title that doesn't really exist because the peerage was never created. The young Bunbury school student who is visiting the Western Australian Parliament recently could be forgiven for any confusion caused by all this when he answered the Highway Hotel when asked to name the hotel in Bunbury named after Western Australia's first Premier. Carmen Lawrence is a farmer's daughter from Murrawa in the northern wheat belt of Western Australia and she has two firsts to her name. Carmen Lawrence was the first woman to be a Premier in Australia and the first woman to be a leader of the opposition. Dr Carmen Lawrence was a very vocal advocate for the need to have more women in Parliament and an early advocate for the need to draw attention to the plight of those with mental illness. Now, Professor Lawrence, at the University of Western Australia, she retired from the federal parliament at the 2007 election, after 21 years as a member of the state parliament of Western Australia, and then the federal parliament. At the time that I was elected saying, I went from being a respected member of the academic community to just another bloody politician. You know, that was pretty much the, if you like, the transition. So I think it's got fiercer, probably, and there's more disillusion with the major parties, and that's another conversation altogether. Uh, but making that transition is not straightforward because from being essentially a private person who can dictate terms in, in, in a sense about, about where you appear in public and with whom and for what purposes, you know, your voluntary work and so on, suddenly you're public property. Walking down the street in Subiaco and hearing this sort of s s whispering behind me and I thought, what's that? And then I realised they were looking at me. And at that, that moment I thought, what have I done? <laughs> this is a terrible mistake to give up privacy. It, it's one of the things I think a lot of people, I certainly hadn't properly anticipated. One of the things that um, is obvious about their partic participation in po politics is there are many more women, which is great, uh, but the, some of the same uh, prejudices still apply. Some of them are frank sexism and even rank misogyny, as Julia Gillard found out, but sometimes it's benevolent sexism. You know, it's kind of patting the little girl on the head kind of sexism. So it's still around, unfortunately, and obviously women in politics have to be particularly alert to it, not to be scratchy about it necessarily, but to call it out. Female firsts feature prominently in Western Australian parliamentary history, such as Dame Florence Cardell Oliver, who in 1947 became the first woman to serve as a minister in any Australian government, but who was also the first woman to be suspended from an Australian parliament. Another formidable woman. Dame Florence was one of the first of many formidable women to be elected to the Western Australian parliament. She entered parliament during the depression of the 1930s and spoke of having to feed families who gathered at her door begging for food. Dame Florence said that this was a common occurrence for many members. She unsuccessfully sought to remove the bar on clergymen standing for Parliament in Western Australia and also spoke passionately about her disgust at the existence of houses of ill repute in Rose Street in Perth and of legalised betting shops. Dame Florence might seem to come across as a stern upholder of traditional values, but interestingly, she also introduced a bill to abolish the death penalty in 1941, many years before it was eventually abolished in 1984. She was criticised for introducing the bill during wartime, but strongly defended her actions. Created a dame of the British Empire in 1951 for her services to Parliament and to Western Australia, Dame Florence Cardell Oliver was a true pioneer of women in politics in Western Australia, and many believe is yet to receive the recognition she deserves. This is a quote from Dame Florence Cardell Oliver, recorded by Hansard, September 1941. Eventually, an armistice will be signed and peace declared, but generations must pass before the passionate hate that has been let loose upon the world by every nation in the world is forgotten. The world will need to be reborn, retaught and reconstructed, and legislation should be in the vanguard. Therefore, I do not apologise for introducing a bill of construction during a period of destruction. Two other firsts that Western Australia is justifiably proud of are Carol Martin and Ernie Bridge. Carol Martin was the first Aboriginal woman to be elected to an Australian parliament and Ernie Bridge was the first Aboriginal man to be elected to a lower house in an Australian parliament. 
He was also the first Aboriginal to become a minister in any government in Australia and the first member of parliament to sing in the chamber. I think he'd die Australian and I sing an Aussie song. The seat of Kimberley in the far north of Western Australia has now been represented by Aboriginal members since Ernie Bridge's election in 1980. Carol Martin followed Ernie Bridge and she was in turn followed by Josie Farrar. When we first realised that I was the first Aboriginal woman elected to any parliament in Australia, my son brought it to our attention and he would have been 14 at the time. And he said, Mum, I can't find another Aboriginal woman in any parliament in Australia. He says, I've Googled, I've Yahooed, I've done all this. <laughs> anyway, so we had to concede that he might be right. And um, yeah, I was really humbled because, you know, like, I didn't think I would actually ever be elected to parliament. I thought, I'm going to have a crack at this because I'm sick of all these blokes trying to speak to up for us. <laughs> And of course, being a screaming feminist as well, as an Aboriginal woman, it's sort of a strange mix, I suppose. <laughs> but when I got into Parliament, it, was, um, it wasn't just me, it was the electorate of Kimberley. You know, there were thousands of people that voted for me and without them, I would never have been put in that position. So I was humbled by them thinking that I was worthy to represent them in Parliament. I was put under a lot of pressure in the 12 years I was a member by Aboriginal people who thought it was, I was the member for Aboriginals. Mm. But the problem with that is, is that when you have such a big electorate like Kimberley, you have to pick your marks and you have to work for the people that elect you and the, who you represent. So I found it really difficult to, um, you know, turn people away. But I'd, I'd ask them to go and speak to their local members, but you know, the, a lot of people felt that I let them down, but I didn't. I was doing my job. And um, that was really difficult, as I said. You know, I had relatives from other electorates ringing me, and I was just saying, look, I can't help you, you know. What, what your problem is, is, you know, it's specific to your area. I said, but I've got all these people that need me here. I said, I've got 14,000 kids, and I'm responsible for them and their future. So if I, you take me off target, then my kids are going to suffer. I can't do it. Western Australia has two other remarkable firsts that would have seemed impossible only a generation ago. Giz Watson is the first openly lesbian member of parliament in Australia and Stephen Dawson is the first serving member of parliament to marry in a same-sex ceremony. It was a short-lived marriage, unfortunately, because even though Stephen Dawson and his partner are still together, the High Court ruled that the Australian Capital Territory could not make laws concerning marriage in Australia. Parliaments, federal or state, are about the people and making laws for the people. Whether it be over 100 years ago, debating the rights of women to vote in an election or to be elected to Parliament, or today, making laws about who is allowed to marry and who isn't. Change is the only constant, and Western Australians can be very proud that their parliament has been at the forefront of change since its very beginning. <laughs>